our tears are for Ben Smith. Our tears are for white people that are attacked every day uh, by non-whites. To understand where Benjamin Smith was coming from, one only has to spend some time with the man who he looked up to, Reverend Matthew Hale. On his East Peoria front porch this afternoon, I asked Hale if he felt compassion for Benjamin Smith's alleged victims. I've interviewed Hale three times since February. His answer today still shocked me. Uh, in our church, uh, compassion for non-whites is, is only, it's like having compassion for uh, an animal that dies, particularly, or uh, an insect or something. Our compassion only extends to our own people. Hale says Ben Smith joined his church just over a year ago and had recently moved to a small town near Peoria to work as Hale's assistant. He was the best distributor of racist literature in the church. We printed 100,000 copies the first time and he passed out probably 35 or 40,000 of them alone. Uh, he would devote whatever money he had for it, uh, whatever time he had for it. Uh, if I called him up and said, hey, uh, you know, I'd like you to pass out some literature, he'd pass it out. Hale had lunch with Smith just a week ago today and saw nothing unusual in the young man's behavior. But Hale suspects that when word came on Friday that Hale had been denied his law license once again, his young supporter snapped. I can't help but feel that my law license being turned down might have been the straw that broke the camel's back. Did he ever talk about violence? Did he? Uh... Never. Never one time. In fact, at the hearing, he testified that one of the things that he appreciated about me was that I had steered him away from violence. Hale says he feels no responsibility for Smith's alleged shootings. There's one message I want to convey to people tonight, or whatever this show airs, or this program, is that be peaceful, be legal, don't commit violence. It is wild, it is violent. If it happened on the streets of Chicago, it'd be assault and battery. You are inside the moshing pits of the Aragon Ballroom, a far cry from the Aragon's ballroom dancing of earlier generations. I was in the mosh pit. I think my finger was broken. Moshing pits at the Vic Theater can be just as rough, as I found out when I was staggered by a forearm smash to the head. Other moshers surf the top of the crowd, just like they do at the Aragon, even though crowd surfing supposedly is prohibited. Security personnel shove them back into the pit or drag them out, but nothing stops them from going right back in. I'll tell you what, man, this is like nothing you've ever so experienced, good, man. man. Everybody was having fun. Everybody's having, Everybody's fun. having fun. It's a good time. Nobody. Nobody's hurting anybody. You'd be getting kicked in the mouth, kicked in the nose, kicked in the head. Moshing evolved from the less violent slam dancing of the 70s and 80s. It continues to evolve, but it's getting more dangerous. It's become a lot more violent and a lot more chaotic. Paul Wertheimer runs crowd management strategies. He's an internationally recognized expert on crowd control. He now lives in Chicago, but he got his start in Cincinnati 16 years ago, authoring the final report on a concert tragedy there. Eleven fans trampled to death at a Who concert. Nobody even knew, really, truly knew what was going on while people were dying. And, and it's assumed that a number of the fans, the 11, died standing up. Wertheimer this week is releasing his final figures on concert safety for 1994. Twelve dead last year. Compared to two deaths in 1993, only one in 1992, six in 1991. For the first time, moshing shows up as a fatal attraction, killing two and leaving three youths paralyzed. Two months ago, Chris Mitchell became the first moshing fatality in the United States. Security guards allegedly threw the Brooklyn youth back into the mosh pit from the stage. Nobody caught him. One of the songs that he, um, he loved to sing was Knocking on Heaven's Door. And he sang it in the style of Guns N' Roses. Many fans believe they can avoid becoming a moshing casualty by avoiding the mosh pits. But there's a new fear a fear that moshing will contribute to a major concert disaster whose victims will include fans who aren't even in the mosh pits. That's because moshing requires so-called festival seating, tickets that don't distinguish between main floor or balcony areas, similar to the 1979 Cincinnati tragedy. 
Well, the problem with festival seating, once something goes wrong, is there's no way to manage the crowd. Festival seating was banned in many cities in the 1980s because of its dangers, but it's made a comeback in the 1990s, in large part because of the popularity of moshing. The occupancy card may call for 2,000 on the first floor and 2,000 on the second floor, and we end up with 3,000 on the first floor and 1,000 on the second floor. A Saturday night at the Riviera Theater. Packed festival seating on the main floor, while other areas, which do count toward the building's approved capacity, are deserted. Festival seating is also now routine for heavy metal concerts at the Vic and the Aragon. There is no building in America that if something happens, that everybody's going to get out safely. Jerry Michelson and Arnie Granite are co-owners of Jam Productions, the promotion firm that handled the Aragon and Vic concerts where I went moshing. They say they discourage moshing but can't stop it. They say security guards keep pathways clear and stand ready to help in an emergency. And they say festival seating isn't a problem as long as concerts aren't oversold. Five million people attend our events just in the last two years. And uh, we also had, in those events, We've had no, no killings, no stabbings, no guns, no anything. Have you ever seen what happens when the music stops? This is not a violent situation. You, you, uh, people um, portray it to be violent. Some fans, though, feel the concerts are dangerously overcrowded. There would have been indefinite trampling if there was a fire. Adding to the potential for disaster, the promoters push beer. Floors at all venues we visited were slippery. Beer got tossed in the air. My cameraman slipped and fell on a wet stairway. At the Aragon, we also found sawhorses, tables, pieces of plywood, and equipment from the band blocking passageways. No smoking signs may as well have been written in a foreign language. In the alleys outside the building, fire escape stairways were obstructed by garbage dumpsters. I'm 15. 15? My birthday thing. I'm 14. I say just go out in flames. I don't care. Don't matter to me. At least I'm going out seeing Slayer. It's that kind of immaturity, combined with a concern about concert dangers, that prompted the Illinois PTA a year ago to ask the city to crack down on concert safety. The PTA's president says a crowd crush incident is inevitable. It could very easily happen here. The fire department themselves said, you know, if there's a tragedy waiting to happen out there, it could easily happen here. Fire and building officials say they're considering action, possibly a requirement that promoters sell separate balcony tickets. We are looking at what steps may be taken by promoters uh, or by the people who attend these concerts so that we are certain that uh, there is safety at all times. They will do something sooner or later. It's just a matter of whether they do something before there's a disaster or whether they do it after. But they will take it. They will have to do something. They are the most sought after trophies in the exclusive world of big game hunting. African game animals, once pursued only on the rolling plains of the African continent, but not anymore. They're now stalked right here in the Midwest. 100 miles outside St. Louis, one hunting club offers sharpshooters sable antelope, $4,000 a piece. Cape Buffalo, $5,000 a head. Sprawling ranches in western Texas offer an exciting fair chase hunt for similar bounty. Just selling animals. No different than selling horses or cattle or whatever. So what? If they were in Africa, the lions would get them. A violent death in the jaws of a lion in Africa is horrible enough, say animal rights groups, but it's preferable to the cruel slaughter of exotic animals which they say now occurs at some hunting clubs. Clubs we found tucked away in backwoods areas from Pennsylvania to Peoria, where animals are often kept in pens until they're domesticated or tame, then released for what's called a canned hunt. These animals are so tame in many cases, it's like leading a lamb to the slaughter. We don't guarantee a kill. But it, it's no kill, no pay. No kill, no pay. The mating call of the killing clubs. If you take a shot at one, make sure there's not another one right behind you. Because if you blow through one and hit another one, you got two. I mean. Welcome to a hunt at the Black Boar Hunting Lodge in Upper Pennsylvania, one of two Ma and Pa operations where I went undercover on a real hunt. A fox cameraman posed as a friend with a handy cam to record the kill. Our request, a Corsican ram. 
We've just started our hunt. The guide brought us onto the property. It's surrounded by about a 10-foot fence. He told us to remain in a wooded area here. He's going to go flush out the Corsican ram, bring them over into our direction where we can get a clean shot at them. Several boars came into view. Then the guide took us a short distance until we approached a fence line visible here by the tall posts. Walking next to the fence, a Rocky Mountain goat and two Corsican rams. $350 for each. I was told I could shoot when I felt comfortable. With a clear shot from about 30 yards, I told the guide I was looking for a bigger animal, and I declined the kill. Just miles down the road from the Black Boar Lodge, this Corsican ram wasn't so lucky. It took several hits with arrows, then a shotgun blow, before falling for a price during a canned hunt. The kill was videotaped by an investigator for the U.S. Humane Society, who was then offered a bigger trophy. Stony Fork offered him a bear in a cage. That's the male, not the female. There were bears on the property in chain link pens, and the investigator was told that for two thousand or so dollars, he could get in the cage with the bear and shoot it, or if he didn't want to enter the cage with the animal, uh, he could climb a ladder placed against the side of the pen and shoot down into the pen to shoot the bear. After my own hunt, I told the club's owner of my real purpose, his first reaction anger at being deceived. But I convinced him to go on camera to defend his business. It gives them a chance to, to get out and, and do it if they don't have the time to, to take a week and, and go someplace and the expense of that. And his response to those who call his operation an unfair canned hunt? You can look at hunting in any aspect and, and make what you want of it. I mean, you can uh, fair chase. You got, you got a gun going 3,000 feet per second, a bullet, and an animal that can go 40 mile an hour. So what's fair? On this rural dirt road, three hours southwest of Chicago, we found the only similar hunting club in Illinois, unmarked by any sign. You got some 100% Russians, okay. Again posing as a hunter, I told owner Gail Brooks I wanted a wild Russian boar. We climbed the fence into the hunting grounds, which covers 350 acres. We passed on female pigs and younger ones. After 90 minutes without seeing a good-sized Russian boar, Gail led us toward his farmhouse. Nearby were two possible targets, a Texas Rambolet sheep or an Angora goat. Neither native to Illinois, Gail told me he buys them at animal auctions. Again, I declined to shoot. A few minutes later, I revealed that I was a reporter from Chicago. The owners were angry, said they'd been suspicious from the start, well, but after some coaxing, they also agreed to talk. Well, it, it, I don't see how they can figure that it's a canned hunt. Some of them ran away from me in the field, but they don't s seem like real wild animals, but they are. When they see you coming, they usually run. They're raised out in the field, they're born out in the field, and, uh, you know, they're as near wild as you're going to get. These are some of the trophies bagged on the Brooks Hunting Preserve. We want a clean hunt. We don't want the animals to suffer. We've always been that way. No, we're not cruel to animals. We take care of our animals. For people not to be able to know that there are sexual pedophiles right around the corner from our kids, right there where they go to school at. That's ridiculous. There is anger and frustration among parents like Carlisa Winston. We had just informed her that every day her children walk to school past a home that's housing not one, not ten, but dozens of paroled sex offenders. According to the state, there are 37 sexual offenders in that home. That's just ridiculous. That's right, the Illinois Sex Offender Registration website shows 37 sex offenders living at 11001 South Wentworth. 13 of them had victims who were juveniles or children, and they're living just two short blocks from the Mildred Laviso Elementary School. Did you have any idea there were sexual offenders living in that home? No, I didn't. The state of Illinois knew. In fact, it's the Illinois Department of Corrections that put them there. And our Fox investigation revealed that at least a dozen of them are not even from Chicago. They were dumped here from counties far beyond Cook County because there aren't enough placement facilities downstate. For example, this is John Baker, convicted of sexually abusing a 13-year-old girl in Effingham County. Carlisa Winston told me her 13-year-old cousin recently complained that one of the residents approached her outside the home. She said a guy approached her and said something out of the way, so she looked at him and she said, well, I'm only nine years old. And he told her, well, I like nine-year-old little girls. The home is run by a group called Cornerstone Recovering Community. The owner would not talk to us, but a manager said there's never been one incident of sexual misconduct. The offenders wear electronic bracelets, 
and they are monitored 24 hours a day. As to downstate sex offenders being shipped to Chicago, we'll hear some of them today piling into a van going back downstate. A corrections official told us that sending inmates here was part of a decade of wrongs, which are just now starting to be corrected. Community activist Harold Davis is still furious that the sex offenders were sent here in the first place. I would say that if they're not welcome back home and, and, and where they committed the crimes, then what make them think that we want them in our community? Because he knew right from wrong. His name was Eric Morse, dropped to his death from the 14th floor window of a CHA high-rise, a horrible crime that touched thousands here in Chicago and even more nationwide because one of the accused killers was 11 years old, the other just 10, a 10-year-old boy named Jesse Rankins. But when you look at Eric Morse, what goes through your mind? The same picture you got right here? I got this picture in my room. In your cell? Yeah. I got a picture, of, I got the same picture right here. I got, a, I got this picture over my wall, over my bed. I got this picture. And why? Because he ain't just heard to die. Rankins is 19 now. He's incarcerated at the Mount Sterling Correctional Center five hours southwest of Chicago. And he's due to be released a year from this June. How are you? In his first television interview, Rankin says it was his upbringing, parents who neglected him and smoked crack cocaine, his father jailed for drug use, which pushed him onto the streets and into a life of crime. My mama and my dad, my, they never taught me what's right and what's wrong. All I saw were things that was wrong. So all I did was do things that was wrong. Eventually, Rankins turned for friendship to the boy who would later become his partner in the Eric Morse killing. We met each other at kindergarten since we was kids. He was my best friend. He's somebody that I can call my family. He was there when nobody wasn't. By the age of 10, Rankin still could neither read nor write. He'd been arrested repeatedly on theft and weapons charges, and he says he was always looking to victimize other, weaker children. Yeah, I was little. I was little. People used to pick on me, used to spit at me, hit me, beat me up, take my money, take everything. So I thought, forget it, when I get older, I want to beat people up. I want to take their money. I want to make the people feel the same pain that I was feeling. It was feelings like those, he says, that led to the torture and killing of Eric Morse. Rankins disputes the long accepted police theory that it was Eric's refusal to steal candy for the older boys that led to the crime. It wasn't about no candy. It was about pride. Kids being bad in the ghetto, bullying people, picking on people. That's what we did. That's all we do, picking on somebody, making them feel pain just like the pain that we was feeling. So we'll go around picking on people. Picking on so-called shorties like Eric Morse, who was sprayed with mace and stabbed in the eye before he and his eight-year-old brother Derek were taken to that vacant 14th floor CHA apartment. When you and your friend took Eric up to that 14th floor, did you intend to throw him out the window? No. Nah. It wasn't no intending to throw him out. It was a clubhouse. I don't know what my friends had in mind, but I ain't see it coming. But I think when he got up to the window and one of my, one of my friends play like that, then it got into everybody's mind. Let's scare him. Let's do it. Let's see what happened. And there it was. Rankin says at first he held Morris up to the open window so they could watch a street fight down below. As I picked him up and let him see the fight, my friend, boof, pushed him out. His brother ran from the corner, grabbed his hand, pulled him back in. My friend tried to throw him out that window. Pulled him back in. Put him back out that window. And my friend bit his hand. That's when he fell to his death. If we believe your version, how could you still stand there and watch someone drop that little boy out the window? Well, I put them in my shoes, and then I asked them, you tell me what you would do. 
I was 10 years old. He was five years old. I was five years older than him. I ain't know nothing. All I knew how to hurt people. Rankin says that while his 11-year-old friend fled the scene, he raced downstairs with Eric's brother, Derek, hoping Eric could somehow be saved. When we got down there and I picked him up, he was coughing, shaking, and blood was coming out of his mouth and his ears and his nose. He wasn't there yet, but when they didn't get that, that's when he died. His brother pushing on his stomach, pushing on his chest, then he rolled over and died. That's when he died. I saw when he died. Rankin says he had no idea what was going on in the juvenile proceedings which followed, where he appeared to show absolutely no remorse. The witnesses in the court said that you were even mouthing obscenities at people. Yeah, because they look at me, they look at me dirty, shake their head, and they, they'll talk about me. But then when I say something back to them, I'm doing something wrong. After his conviction, Rankins was sent to a youth prison where at age 12, he participated in a sexual assault on another inmate. With good behavior as a troubled juvenile, he might have been out by now. Instead, he received nine more years, and he wonders now if he's even capable of handling life on the outside. Get out in the world, I don't know how to do nothing. One problem with getting out, he says, is living with a label, Eric Morse's killer. With everybody around his world, talking about, I'm going to hear baby killer for the rest of my life. But unlike nine years ago, Rankin's now is a baby killer who's willing to apologize for a crime that stunned the nation. If Eric Morse's mother and father were sitting here instead of me, what would you tell him? I'm sorry. I know it's hard to forgive me for the things that, the, for the thing that happened, but I hope one day they forgive me. For what happened to their baby. Well, it's, it was a stupid thing to do, but I did it. The last time William oh, Billy Laguie faced the cameras, he was a bare chested, boisterous bully with tattoos covering his upper body and an attitude to match. You look a little different now. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now he looks more like an older, bespectacled Harry Potter than a tough Bridgeport bruiser. This was last Thursday, one week before Thanksgiving. But Laguie was having his Thanksgiving dinner a week early. The next morning, he checked into this South Suburban Drug and Alcohol Rehab Center for 28 days of rehabilitation. If you could say something to the coach, if you could say something to Mr. Gamboa, what would you say? I'm truly sorry about all of this that happened. And I, was, I hope you can forgive me. And there's a melee on the field. A couple of fans entered the field and lost their minds. It had been two months since Lagui and his 15-year-old son had burst onto the field at Comiskey Park and at the same time into the national spotlight. As a result of the attack, Kansas City Royals first base coach Tom Gamboa suffered some partial Gamboa. hearing loss. Legui says his defense attorney has told him not to discuss the events of September 19th. His fiance Kelly says the only thing he remembers about that night is waking up in jail, which wouldn't be the first time. Legui's rap sheet includes convictions for domestic battery in 1995 and residential burglary nine years earlier. And he's been in rehab before just over a year ago for drunk driving. So this one-time supervisor for Whole Foods is no stranger to trouble. But his fiance claims the attack at Comiskey was more than just the drunken outburst of a South Side punk. See. What happened with the birth of your daughter? She was born with two holes in her heart. Her lung wasn't formed right. And she was born with a missing clavicle, missing ribs, and missing fingers. She lived for how long? She lived for a month and nine days. Their daughter, named Tabitha, died on May 15th. Legui's fiance says he turned to drugs and alcohol for consolation all summer long. He's not like that. I, he, was, he was going through hard times because of our daughter, which she died in May. Since then, he's, he's been bad. He's been drinking and, you know, doing other things, which I understand why, because he didn't know how to deal with it. That was his first daughter. It, it hurt him. It hit his heart. Then, two days before the Sox game, the family got a call from St. Mary's Cemetery in Evergreen Park. They say cemetery officials asked them to remove the planter box from Tabitha's gravesite. There was no headstone yet. Such planter boxes 
could be a breeding ground for the West Nile virus. And that's, he like freaked him out. He went to the cemetery either that night or the night that morning and went to get the planter box and had to go dig to a dumpster to find her planter box because they had removed it before we could get out there to take it. And he was really upset. I mean, broke down over it. Three weeks ago in juvenile court, however, William Legui was portrayed as anything but a grieving father. His son's probation officer testified that Legui had beaten his son, burned him with cigarettes, and repeatedly challenged his manhood, all of which supposedly led the son to join on? his father in storming the field. I love my son, and I don't know what all these allegations are that they're putting against him to say against me, but no, they're not true, and I can prove it if it comes down to it. With the, about the cigarette burns, the cigarette burns, he was not, his father was not burning him. He was standing out on our balcony, showing off to the girl next door to us, burning himself, saying, look, I'm a man, I'm a man, I can burn myself. Legui claims his former girlfriend, the boy's mother, raised the boy for most of the last 15 years, so she's the one to blame for the boy's problems. But the son's juvenile court attorney, Christopher Swanson, told me, I don't think my client is confused about what happened or that his father did it to him. Outside juvenile court three weeks ago, Coach Gamboa also focused on the father. I certainly have more compassion for the kid than I do for the dad. He feels sorry for doing that to an old man. I mean, that was like, hey, to his, be doing that to his father. He, it, it hurts him that he done something like that. Some may see Legui's new clean-cut look and his month-long stint in rehab as little more than window dressing by a street-smart thug who, if convicted, faces several years in jail. But with respect to his son, at least, Legui claims his feelings are sincere. I'm sorry for all of this, and I'm, I'm sure it's not his fault, the things that they made him say, and they twisted up the, all the words that he told them. They twisted everything around. On Chicago's Magnificent Mile, both shoppers say they worry an awful lot about style, quality, and price, but not at all about where or how a hot new fashion may have been produced. I notice it, but it doesn't affect if I buy it or not. Made in Indonesia. Ah, oh, we missed it. Does that matter to you? No. As long as it just look good on me, I don't care. Maybe he would care if he could gaze into the tired eyes of 13-year-old Ruth Gomez. Ruth works 60 hours a week in a Guatemalan garment factory. She, like thousands of other young garment workers, has sacrificed her schooling, sacrificed her youth, in fact, for American apparel companies. Her mother works in the same factory. The two of them can barely support a family of five in a metal shack with dirt floors. This is for comfort? And cardboard mattresses. And the income that you and your daughter receive, could you live any better than this? The money that we make is not enough. The shirts and trousers produced by Ruth and other garment workers are displayed on the glittering steel racks of Chicago's biggest department stores. That's where our Fox investigative team purchased the clothes and then tracked them to the Central American factories where they were made. We focused on Guatemala, where 10 years ago there were just 15 garment factories, known there as maquilas. Now there are over 400, in large part because women there and children will work for virtually nothing. Can she show me the scissors and what she does? Okay. Ruth Gomez is typical of younger maquila workers. She was hired at l l Fashions just outside Guatemala City when she was 12 years old, even though hiring children under the age of 14 is illegal. She earns about $2.90 a day, not $2.90 an hour, just $2.90 per day, just over 36 cents an hour. Oh. See? See? Despite the language barrier, Ruth had no difficulty identifying a Montgomery Ward shirt that we bought in Chicago under the revenge label as a product of her own young hands. Ruth and other workers told us of working conditions that would be criminal if found in the United States. Thousands of Maquila workers arrive for work every morning around 7.30. Many of them won't be released from the factories until they've met their production quotas late into the evening. What time does she start? All night, from 7 at night till 4 in the morning. Factories with poor ventilation and sweatshop-like temperatures. We don't get any air. It's so hot that it feels like being at the beach. One question is why do employers hire such young 
young girls uh, in their factories. There are plenty of other uh, people needing work in Guatemala who are of age. And I think that the answer is uh, employers believe that young women are going to give them the least amount of problems. The owner of this maquila, which makes clothing for Sears, Kmart, and Montgomery Ward, prefers young workers because they have better eye-hand coordination. And he prefers women because they are more obedient. Boys who try to uh, resist, uh, not to receive any instructions from our supervisors. It's only the boys who resist, though. The, yeah. the women follow orders? Yeah, majority of the women yeah, follow yeah, orders better than you know, boys. And the children are not? Uh, not so much. <laughs> and why is it difficult? Can she tell me? Because I work all day and I am minor, and they force me to work until 5.30 or 6.30. You sure you don't want to talk? The owner of l and Fashions wouldn't agree to an on-camera interview, but he told me he is unaware that any of his workers are under the legal working age of 14. He also denied forcing employees to work overtime. When we told Montgomery Ward officials of our findings, the Chicago-based retailer opened their own investigation, telling us, we will not tolerate the use of child, prison, or slave labor in the manufacture of goods anywhere in the world. If our investigation shows that our policy has been violated, we will take the necessary action. The vast majority of maquila workers live in poverty, and they say they'd rather work in a maquila than have no job at all. But more and more, they're beginning to wonder why they have to work in such deplorable conditions. What would you say to El, the president, El Presidente Montgomery Wards? To Mr. President, I would like to tell them to treat us Guatemalans fairly. It's true that we are poor, but we have the right to better treatment and a better salary. Because if they are making money, it's because we are helping them and we have a right for better treatment. Robbins police officer Sam Alloway is in pretty good spirits, and can you blame him? Instead of fighting crime in Robbins, where violent crime jumped 30% last year, he's in Blue Island, the suburb next door, helping one of his colleagues get around the law. Officer Gibson, my name's Larry Yellen, Channel 32. This is another Robbins police sir? officer, Aaron Gibson, arriving for work. And here he is leaving for work from his south side Chicago home eight miles away. But Officer Gibson doesn't drive all the way to the Robbins police station. He parks two miles away in Blue Island. That's when Officer Alloway arrives. He drives Officer Gibson the rest of the way to the police station. On some days, Officer Gibson sits alone in a squad car for his eight-hour shift. The car never moves. And then at the end of the day, a squad car drives Officer Gibson back to Blue Island, to his SUV, and he drives away. So why is the Robbins Police Department chauffeuring Officer Gibson around? Because our instructions was that if he was caught driving, period, didn't matter, you know, where he was caught, if he was caught driving, that he would be arrested. Officer Gibson's driver's license was suspended in 1994 after he was in an accident and failed to pay for the damages. In 1997, another accident, again, he failed to pay the victim, and a second suspension was placed on his license. Five times he's been convicted of driving on a suspended license. He came to work. His problem was driving. Chief Holmes says Officer Gibson produced what appeared to be a valid driver's license when he was hired three years ago. When the suspensions were later discovered, the chief offered Officer Gibson some time to clear up his record as long as he stopped driving. As he sat in the squad car at the trailer home, if there had been an urgent call someplace, he could not drive from that location. He had no driving privileges. Prime. He was driving November the 19th because he was the officer that pulled me over. So he was driving November 19th, 2001. Yes, sir. Don't try and tell Tanja Harrison that Officer Gibson sat parked in that squad car all day long. He pulled her over last November. And guess what she was cited for? Suspended license, revoked license, um, speeding, failure to, failure to slow down. Should he have been driving and pulling over people? Of course not. Of course not. And what was Miss Harrison's reaction when she learned that Officer Gibson had a suspended license? I think maybe there should have been another cop there to write him a ticket or pick him up also. But what happens when there is another cop there? 
you believe none of the officers in the department knew he was driving? Or were they giving him a pass? Well, I think it's obvious that at least one or two officers gave him a pass. Because chief Holmes showed us two memos ordering Officer Gibson to stop driving. But the chief admits he signed off on the chauffeur's service. He told me that he was being dropped by a friend at 127th and Kedzie. And it was convenient in their travels if someone could pick him up uh, as they were passing through. So I had no problem with that's less than three minutes from here. But we also caught Officer Gibson sometimes driving directly to the Robbins Police Department. He parked in full view of almost anyone nearby, but apparently we were the only ones watching. Officer, could I see your driver's license? Officer Gibson refused to answer any questions, but on this occasion, we immediately informed the police that he had driven himself to work. They decided to write him a ticket, but by the time they got outside, he was gone, behind the wheel once again. Knowing that he was driving his vehicle and parking and picking up, being picked up, was totally uh, inappropriate, and, and we've taken action on that. He violated the order not to drive. And as a result of that, you know, he'll be seeking employment elsewhere. Sit. Harris. Harris. Alex Viatkin runs the nation's only training kennel for Presa Canarios, the powerful dogs that have been blamed for the fatal mauling of 33-year-old Diane Whipple in a San Francisco high-rise. She got scared because of the dogs, and her immediate reaction was like, shake. Viatkin is just speculating as to what triggered the attack, but he's very familiar with the lineage of Bane, the dog that lunged at Whipple's throat because Bane's mother, Karma, came from his Red Star kennel. We check her temperament. She was absolutely a stable dog. They're normally good dogs. Viatkin sold Karma to James Harris, a backyard breeder here on Chicago's northwest side. One of Karma's litters produced Bane, Harris later sold for $1,200 to a woman in rural California who reportedly kept her dogs on 25-foot chains day in and day out. As they taking dog from the chain, put him in an apartment, and walk him in an apartment without, without leash. Uh, I mean, that's a tragedy. I mean, you're asking for it right there. Go ahead, give it a try. Give it a try. Give it a oh. That's the seven-year-old grandfather of the dog that killed Diane Whipple taking a run at me as Viatkin illustrated how well-trained Presa Canarios will always stop on command. But Viatkin also says the San Francisco attack has created a hot market for cheaper crossbred Presa Canarios with potentially dangerous temperaments. If you don't temperament test dogs, I mean, there is always a possibility of creating a monster. In Hudson, Wisconsin, Larry Yellen, Fox News, Chicago. As of five, the divisions of elections reported receiving recount results from 53 counties in Florida. We are still awaiting the results from the supervisors of elections in 14 Florida counties. After two excruciating days while the entire country has been on hold, the Florida Secretary of State tonight announced that George Bush is leading by 1,784 votes, but the recount is still not complete. State officials say there should be no complaints about waiting a few more days. Uh, if you want simplicity, just go about 70 miles south of, Flo of Florida and you got Cuba, and they're very simple. They have no elections. I'm going to buy some clothes because it looks like I'm staying overnight. Gore campaign chairman Bill Daly apparently caught unprepared for another night here and announcing today that the Gore team is fully supporting lawsuits in Palm Beach County, which alleged that some 19,000 ballots were improperly thrown out. We believe that that is a total... Uh, uh, injustice and has therefore caused an uh, inaccurate count to this point. No question uh, Al Gore won this state as he won the nation. The Palm Beach County voters claim that their so-called butterfly ballots with names on both sides caused a single punch for Al Gore to register as a double punch as if they voted twice. Mr. Baker, the uh, Gore campaign says they think if it's a fair vote they'll have enough votes to win Florida. What do you think? We'll talk about all of this when we come out of the building, okay? George Bush's point man here, former Secretary of State James Baker, says those votes should be tossed. There's not a jurisdiction in this democracy of ours that does not discard ballots where a voter votes twice for 
two different candidates for the same office. That's what happens in our democracy. If that's what happened here, I don't see how you can count those ballots. At the Pentagon this afternoon, rescue workers unfurled a giant American flag. A short while later, President Bush arrived to show his support for a difficult recovery effort that has so far turned up 80 fatalities, hundreds of other victims now presumed dead. The president's visit coming shortly after he told an anxious nation that the terrorists will pay for their actions. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. The president did not specifically ask the Congress for a declaration of war. For now, he's asking for a supplemental spending bill that would give him a virtual blank check for a war on terrorism. Exactly. Secretary of State Colin Powell said that even though the United States has previously urged other countries to show restraint in response to terrorist attacks, the rules now may have changed. I think when you're attacked by a terrorist and you know who the terrorist is and you can fingerprint back to the cause of the terror, you should respond. Capitol Hill remained closed to tourists today. A widespread area around the Capitol was cordoned off by roadblocks, and talk of war was definitely in the air. If he were to ask for a declaration of war, would you support that? Absolutely. I think this, is a, this was war. Uh, this may be America's bloodiest day. This is our Black September, and uh, I think the American people uh, we'll all remember where they were uh, when they heard this. This is our generation's uh, Pearl Harbor or, or JFK assassination. And um, our country is now at war, uh, but we don't know with whom. After an intelligence briefing late this afternoon, Illinois Senator Dick Durbin virtually guaranteed there will be a military response if Osama bin Laden or other terrorist groups are determined to have orchestrated the attacks. I think a military uh, response is appropriate. What he did was nothing short of an invasion of the United States and killing of American civilians. We have to put the pressure on him on a military basis if he's identified as the source of this terrorism. Officer Lee, Larry Yellen with Fox News, how are you? Claudine Lee is a Chicago Police Department traffic aide. Aides like Miss Lee help make sure the traffic moves smoothly through the loop, especially at lunchtime and during rush hours. As long as you do that, I don't care. Traffic aides also write parking tickets when drivers illegally take up those hard-to-get places. One of the Loop's biggest problems in recent years has been healthy drivers illegally using disability placards to park at parking meters all day long without paying a dime. And on two separate occasions last week, we found Claudine Lee, who spends hours every day on her feet directing traffic, claiming she was disabled in order to park for free. We noticed that you were using a handicapped placard to park your car downtown. Are you, do you have a disability? Check it out. I we had already checked it out with Secretary of State Jesse White's office. She's not the authorized holder of the placard. The placard was not issued to her, so therefore she's using that placard illegally. Disability placards are supposed to be available for those who are physically incapable of walking more than 200 feet without stopping to rest. The state says the disability placard in Miss Lee's car belongs not to her, but to her disabled mother, who has to be in the car when the placard is used. You listen, get out of my face! Claudine Lee herself did not appear to be disabled. While on the job at Michigan and Randolph, she held a shopping bag in one hand and a newspaper under her arm, all while directing traffic with her other hand. When her shift was over, she walked nine blocks across the loop to Congress and Wabash, where her car was parked at a parking meter. Do you have a disability? Which in, I just wanted to find out how you can park with that placard. You're an officer of the Chicago Police Department. Are you entitled to tar park with that placard? I'm not a policeman. Get away from me. Don't touch me again. Would you get away from me and get out of my face. I want it. I'd like you to get know out why. Of my face. Are you disabled, ma'am? It is a serious matter to us. It's a very serious matter to me, and we're definitely going to look into it. Chicago's top traffic cop, Commander Ron Sedini, says that because of our story, the department has now opened an investigation into Miss Lee's use of the placard. Over the last two months, this belongs to Sarah. Chicago police, working with the Secretary of State's office, 
have conducted a series of early morning sweeps through the loop, cracking down on disability placard cheaters. So far, 93 drivers have been charged, but none of them had worked for the Chicago Police Department. I think it's a, a violation of trust if an individual is misusing a, a handicap placard. Uh, obviously, these, these uh, permits are made to assist those individuals who need that extra um, courtesy. And uh, again, we just we can't have that occurring, and especially from someone who's responsible for enforcing the law.